Welcome to my church. So, every now and then someone asks me, so what do you do for a living? And that's a difficult question because I'm partly photographer, partly videographer, partly designer, semi-audio engineer, producer. And all this together, I can do this together with Marie, Igor and Bob in a collective called Le Monde Dumas. And together we claim to be contemporary archivists of our heritage. <coughs> we do this by taking something from our tradition and putting it in a new way, using new technologies. So the Deca beat machine is something I will talk to you about from the perspective of a DJ. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you the first DJ ever in our opinion. And that's this guy. And his name is Leon de Cap. And as you can see, he's not really playing... Uh, but he's not playing vinyl records. As a matter of fact, he's operating a machine that's playing automated music. And it's a machine that he invented himself. So, uh, but of course, that was his backstage that you saw. And this is his front that most of the people could see back in the day. So this is what people used to dance to on where you are standing now. And this thing is filled with pipes, wooden pipes, and they play notes. So how do they get triggered? They use the system of punching cards. And a punching card for everyone born after the 1920s is actually the first data carrier. So. You have to imagine that this is long, so it doesn't fit the screen, and it gets full of little dots, and every time a little dot passes a bar or a sensor, it triggers a device into this construction to actually blow air through one of these pipes. Now, the funny thing is that there's a huge similarity with modern day sequencing, as you can see in this little movie clip. Funny how this sounds in this place. <laughs> and we have to skip to a couple of years later, after the first world war. And as you all know, a world war is kind of a messy thing to happen in your town, but it has some benefits to it, which means you come in contact with new cultures and their technologies, but you also um, have this economic uprise that makes that people for the first time in Belgium, people could actually spend money on stuff that was not really necessary to survive. Which led to the fact that they also had uh, off days, like Sundays, and they could go um, to entertain themselves, to have fun, to dance, to drink, to go to places where they could meet other people. And in the beginning of, these, uh, of this period, you had this kind of stuff dropping by at your village for two, three weeks. And it's called a mirror tent. So these were built. People went there to dance and to drink and to have fun. Now, this is not um, Hindu Kenny, but uh, a map of such a place. So as we can see here, that's the entrance, that's the bar, this area is a dance floor. The red dot over there is the place where usually this kind of organ was set up. So the idea was everyone gather to dance in front of this thing. And this all was going well for years until this guy with the moustache decided to make a new world war and then everything was a bit uh, rumbly again but there's one benefit to that war too, if it's really a benefit, we don't know, but he introduced the cars to Western Europe. And this changes the whole idea of entertainment. Because people 
didn't have to wait anymore for this mirror tent to arrive in their village to have fun. No, they could just drive their cars through the new roads that were there and, and go towards the entertainment themselves. And that's where the dancings opened. And the dancings were just buildings by the side of the road, being the first kind of club, disco, whatever. And the interior of a dancing is a little bit different from what we know today as a disco. It's more a sort of tavern because you could also have some snacks and everything. But the idea was that at a certain time, these organs started playing. And again, everyone started dancing. Now, in the meantime, the Decap organ builders have, had made some major progress. They didn't have only the pipes, which we see here, but they also invented the system to automate these accordions. So they were playing automatically. Also, this drum was playing all sequenced, still with punching cards. Now, this was all going well, and this is kind of the vibe you could expect in a club like this. And then the 80s arrived and the whole darkness until we showed up in 97. That's a very bold thing to say, but actually it was, because something changed. The 80s brought so much new things, like home entertainment systems and, and disco clubs, where actual DJs were playing vinyl records and, and everything went up to a new level, like a next level thing. And these organs, they became a bit obsolete, and these dancings, were having problems because there was this law passed by about drinking and driving. So who was going to drive there and drink and drive back if it was a fine? So it's it's coming to an end. And somewhere late 90, 96, 97, I don't know, we visited one of these places. And their audience was so old. And they I think they even had nursery rooms installed for their people. There was nothing going on, but the funny thing was that there were two old people dancing in front of it and we were so charmed by this typical sound and by this vibe it had that we decided that we should try and, and do something with this. Because we were DJs for already 10 years, remixing and producing, doing this electro clash uh, mashup stuff and we sampled already all kinds of genres except organs, of course. And um, then we were so lucky that we could find on flea markets, we found these funny vinyl recordings uh, of organs playing all kinds of evergreens and kitsch music. So, and um, we started sampling it and editing and filtering, mixing, adding beats and, and stuff. And this resulted in this EP um, that's, that became a kind of a cult record uh, after a couple of years. And it was all very nice, but uh, then we figured out we should try to make a show, a real performance with an organ to get the people back in front of the organ and to dance. So that's easier, easier said than done, of course, because how do you go from this vibe into a modern day setting that goes more and more like this? You just have to go harder, better, faster and stronger. Daft Punk said it. So. That's what we did. Um, so the first thing we did was visit the organ factory. They were still making organs, constructing them from scratch. New machines. Every day if they finish some pipes or a drum set. Or and um, <coughs> the idea was that we first started sampling every single pipe in this device. Every note also soft, medium and hard plate. 
This we put in a sound bank. The sound bank we took back to our studio. And with this sound bank, we started making a new kind of dance music based on the sounds. Now, the good thing about working in a software studio is that you can have your template wrapped around your construction and that we could easily reconstruct the sound on stage because we can mute our sound bank, but we can have all the effects that go, uh, that are built around the sound, they can easily intercept the sound from the microphone. So we had to do this because the problem was that this organ has a very unique um, sound to it, but it's not really heavy enough for a modern day dance floor. People are used to compressed beats, sub basses, uh, high energetic dynamic stuff going on, and it's impossible to get this from an acoustic instrument. So that's why we made this uh, organogram. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not going to give you all the details, but uh, the idea is that we have the MIDI, because in the meantime, we could control this thing through MIDI instead of punching cards all day. So we could actually plug this machine into our laptop, send the notes, play this track, and um, add the extra sound with software and with amplification, like a PA setup. So OK, the music was done. The effects were there. The sound was ready. We even had our take up beat machine set up. But then we had another problem. The drums, they move. You can see them drum. It's very hard to see here, but these accordions, they also play automatically. Here is a bunch of xylophones and wood blocks. And from a distance of six meters, you cannot see really what's going on. There's, there's a lot of high technological stuff going on there, but it's not visually. And then the other thing is that this, 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 and all this here is a bunch of pipes, I guess like 365 pipes, and they are all playing, and they, they do it very well, but you don't see them playing. So the problem is that you're looking at something, but you can not really figure out where the sound comes from. That's how we got to this idea of highlighting a note, like if we play this one, we wanted this one to light up or something. So then we were like, okay, uh, let's maybe, let's, but let's have a, a very big problem that it's expensive. And as you can see here, it works for these really small pipes. It's okay. But not for the big ones because the light just got like this or this high, I don't know, it was no impact at all. And what we wanted to do was actually have this organ lit in this way with these colors that we could change and if we play one pipe, we want that pipe to light up or, or whatever we want to do with it. And for that reason we had to think about something with a projector. So. That's when we started programming a piece of software um, that could actually real-time, via MIDI input, uh, video map this entire thing in 3D because the setup is never exactly the same. Sometimes you can have something skewed or, or more upfront. And so it all had to be modular. Uh, so we started uh, the drawing board and then we had some uh, first, we had to make all these pipes in, in a 3D modeling package to import it in a virtual world, and the virtual world got controlled via MIDI. Now, this is a very rough uh, test setup we did with some cubes, and every surface of a cube is linked to a node uh, that we trigger. And then in the next uh, movie, you see that we actually can move the light source to show that this thing is really three-dimensional uh, architecture. So when this all worked, our theory became reality and um, we had a tryout at the uh, Vorat where, we show, where I can show you the setup. 
these are pipes for uh, pumping the air through the pipes and uh, the accordions. These are all trusses because this top thing on our heads is like 350 kilograms. That's the computer set up for the video mapping application. And here you can see um, more or less the effects. Uh, it's not so good on video as if you are there, but these are. Uh, this is one track uh, extract from the show we did in uh, Brussels. That's about it. It's just uh, I want to mention that for people who are really interested in history of organs, uh, we just finished a documentary about the DECAP organ builders, so we are planning to put it online uh, very soon. And um, for the ones who like to dance, uh, they can also visit our show. Uh, we are playing three nights at uh, Tomorrowland in July. So, and I guess that will be a whole lot of more fun than my talk. So. <laughs> Thank you.